welcome back this week. I'm really excited you guys are here because I have a very exciting recipe to share with you. I've had so many people um, talk to me and say, I wished I knew how to make homemade bread and it just seems so confusing and I'll make it and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes it's perfect and moist and sometimes it's dry and crumbly and I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. And so I've had a lot of conversations with people and I actually used to struggle a lot with homemade bread um, years ago. And then I discovered three tricks that you can do, three tips that will ensure that your bread is perfect every time. Now, if you've watched very much of my content here, you will notice that I'm always telling you about these little tricks, two tricks for this and a trick for that. And it really, cooking isn't as hard as a lot of people may think it is when you're doing things, um, baking like pie crust or biscuits or things like that. Um, it's just that there are certain techniques that need to be done in order to achieve a perfect result every time. And if you don't know those tips and tricks, then you're going to struggle. And um, it all depends on the weather, the humidity, um, the altitude, everything that's playing into your bread making scenario really plays into the success of your bread. And I didn't understand that for a long, long time. And so I would have success with an all-purpose, just a white loaf of bread. And then I'd want to move it up a notch to know how to make a healthy loaf of bread with whole wheat and fresh ground. And so the success that I had had, then all of a sudden I wouldn't have success and things would start failing. And then I would have a successful loaf of whole wheat bread. And then the next time I would make it, it would be dry and crumbly. And I, I'd be pulling my hair out trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. And so I thought that I would hop on here and we would make a loaf of bread together and I would give you the three tips that you need um, to really understand how to gauge your bread and the success um, or when you reach a certain point that you can move on to the next step. And um, while yes, I do normally make whole wheat bread and I'll make fermented bread. Um, the most basic loaf of bread, the easiest loaf of bread is just your all-purpose white flour. And while no, that isn't the most healthiest choice when you're making bread, we really need to start with the easiest bread so that you can really master that before you move into um, using whole grains and freshly ground flours and um and that's just you know you just add layer upon layer of knowledge and your loaf of bread you know you'll be able to have a consistent loaf of bread whether you make an all-purpose or you make a whole grain um, but we really i just wanted to lay the foundation um, just teach the technique with something that I know you're going to have success with because if you keep having failures you're going to get um, discouraged and you're going to stop and so I really want you to have success and so we're just going to make a basic loaf of white bread um, and you can try your hand at that and I know you're going to have success if you just follow what it is that I'm teaching here and then um, you know I can add on layer upon layer um, but always referring back to this tutorial. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna get our yeast um, activated. So we use an active dry yeast. Now you have probably heard about instant or rapid yeast or um, and then the activated dry yeast. I'm not using an instant yeast. Um, instant yeast you could just put right into your dough. You wouldn't have to reactivate it. You wouldn't have to bring it out of dormancy. You would just put it right in the bowl um, with the rest of your stuff and continue on. I like to use an active dry yeast and it's um, this is a yeast that is active but it's been dehydrated and so we need to bring it back um, to its active state. And so um, the way that you do that is you put it into warm water. Now if the water is too hot it will kill it and it, it won't do anything. It just needs to be, it likes that warm, cozy environment. And I like to stick between 100, 110, no more than 115. So that would be the temperature of your water. And then I put the yeast in that 
and I add a little bit of sugar because the sugar is what feeds the yeast. So as the yeast is um, waking up, it is it has the sugar to feed it and it will become very, very active and very, very bubbly. And it is going to work really amazing in your dough, rising that bread to get the most fluffiest tall bread that we can get. So what I like to do is I heat my water on the stove and um, I put, we're going to use two cups of water in this recipe, and I put about um, half, like a cup, a cup and a half um, of hot water, and then I top it off with some cooler water, um, and then I have a digital meat thermometer that I love to use because, you know, I could feel it, but I'm just a real um, exact kind of person. Like, I, I like to just know that I'm doing it exactly right. And so I will measure the water, and if it's anywhere from like 105 to 115, I know it's okay. So I'm going to add a little bit um, of cold water. And so now we've got two cups, and I'm going to um, see what the temperature is of this water. Now, I mean, you could just stick your finger in it, and if it's like, wow, that's really warm, more than likely it's going to kill your yeast. If it's, um, if it's just nice, warm you know, like it doesn't feel like it would burn you, then it would probably be okay. But like I said, I like to be exact. So I'm going to see, I'm going to say that this is probably five to 10 degrees too hot is my guess. Yeah. So it's one, um, it passed the 115 mark. So 115 is the highest temperature that I'll go. So it is um, coming in at about 119. So I'm just going to wait a couple minutes. And once I get that down, I'm just going to bring it down to 110. Um, then we will continue. Okay, so the water is at about 111. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and use it. So as I said, anywhere between 105 to 115. So that's right in there. Now... Um, what you're going to do is you're just going to pour your water into the bowl that we're going to mix the dough in. And then we're going to put the, the yeast in, which my recipe calls for two packages of yeast. And a package of yeast is a tablespoon. So I'm going to put the two tablespoons. And then I pre-measured my sugar. This is the amount of sugar we're going to need for the whole recipe. And so... Out of that, I'm just going to grab some of it to put in here to feed this yeast as it's waking up from its dehydrated state. Um, not any particular amount, it's just, you know, what a couple tablespoons out of that. And I'm going to mix it real good. And what I like to do is, as we're waiting for this to come alive, come awake, and become very bubbly, it could take anywhere from... 10 to 30 minutes. So I'm just kind of trying to dissolve that sugar in there. So what I do is a lot of people have the granite countertops which get cold and this really needs a warm environment for it to do what it needs to do. And so I don't generally, I mean this isn't granite, but um, I just have, oh, I used to have granite and I've just always gotten in the habit of not leaving this on the counter. And usually I've heated my water up in my teapot, so my stovetop is um, warm. So I'll just set it there. So since we don't know how long it's going to take, 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's kind of a long time to wait. So I will usually just run in the kitchen, I'll get that started, and then while that's doing its thing, I'll gather up my ingredients, I'll, you know, the loaf pan and all that. And, um, you know, wash a few dishes or whatever. So I'm not just standing here waiting for the yeast to become active. Um, so when, as soon as this is bubbly, I'll turn the camera in so you can see what it looks like. In fact, right now I'm going to turn it in so you can see what it looks like before it becomes active. And then I'll give you a shot of what it looks like once it's ready to go. So as you can see, this there's a lot of bubbles here. Most of those bubbles are because I was stirring it with a whisk. Some of them are the activity as the yeast is waking up, but like I said, most of it is from the whisk. All around here, you can see this is just plain water. It's, you know, 
in between the bubbles. It's just plain water. So what we're looking for is when this is active, the whole surface of this is going to be very bubbly and it will have actually risen in the bowl. Um, so we're just going to wait for that to happen. So while we're waiting for this yeast to become activated, I want to explain a couple ways that you could make this. Now, normally when I make homemade bread, I use either my Bosch or I use my KitchenAid. So a Bosch is a big, it's a, got a heavy duty motor in it and it's, you can use it just like you would a KitchenAid, but like you can, you know, mix cookies or do whatever you want in that Bosch, but I bought it and mostly the main thing I do with it is to make bread. I do have a KitchenAid as well and that you know, I'm whipped cream, anything from whipped cream to butter to cookies, cakes, um, and bread. But the difference between the two machines is the, the Bosch just has a much heavier duty motor. And so the, when I make bread every week, like over time, if I make, and I'll make like four to six loaves at a time, over time, that much wear and tear on my KitchenAid is going to wear my KitchenAid down a lot quicker. So I get my Bosch and I um, make my bread in there. And then I use the KitchenAid for um, every once in a while if I don't feel like cooking up my whole Bosch. I will go ahead and make some bread in there. But things like pizza dough and cookies and that kind of stuff I'll make in my KitchenAid. Now that's my favorite way is to make it with an electric machine because the kneading... It could take, you know, 8 to 10 minutes to knead it, and I can just put all the ingredients in there, turn the um, switch on, and it does its thing, and I can clean dishes and go do something else. But for this tutorial, I am going to make this bread by hand because a lot of people don't have a Bosch, and a lot of people don't have a KitchenAid. Um, and so I want this to be very doable for anybody and I really feel like you really should get the foundation of knowing how to make a loaf of bread just by hand um, you know that's just such a skill and there's something really fun about kneading the bread with your hands it's very rewarding it's very therapeutic and a lot of times if I'm just making one or two loaves and I don't feel like going out and getting my Bosch in my outdoor pantry I will actually still need it by hand if I've got a podcast playing. So um, I just I just wanted to make this one by hand so that, you know, if you're a beginner cook or you haven't been able to afford getting a good heavy-duty machine, you can still make bread. So it's kind of like starting at the ground level of doing it by hand, starting at the ground level of using the easiest flour, just making this as doable and easiest as possible for you. But if you do make bread and you have purchased a KitchenAid or a Bosch and you're watching this tutorial just because you're struggling a lot with your bread and you want to kind of learn those three tips, um, then feel free to go get your Bosch or your KitchenAid and um, do everything in there. Um, but in this tutorial, we're doing it by hand. Wow, look at that. It is really, really risen. So this yeast, it has been brought out of its, um, like its sleep, its dehydrated sleep um, that it's been in. And it has woken it up. It's been fed with sugar. And now it is super, super active. And it is going to be strong enough to rise your loaf of bread. Okay, so our dough or our yeast mixture is ready to go. So the... Um, well, let's see. I'll wait to get to this. the first tip. Um, let's go ahead. This recipe, not all bread recipes call for eggs, but this one that I like to use, this white bread recipe, does call for two eggs. And so we're going to go ahead. I want to mix them um, well so that when they go into the dough, they're already mixed. That's good. So once, one tip, once this has risen and become activated, you don't just want to leave it sitting for a long, long period of time because it's actually going to go back to sleep. So you want to catch it um, while it's active and it's bubbly and, you know, so that it has that power to raise your bread. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and dump the rest of the sugar in there. And I'm going to put my fat, which I'm using a coconut oil that I um, melted down because it was hard 
Um, of course, you wouldn't want this hot, but that's what I'm using. And then I've got some salt. Actually, um, so a lot of times salt, it can start to kind of slow down your yeast. So I always, I, I always like to add just a little bit of flour over the top, and then I put my salt in. I don't like to just dump it right into the yeast. And then I'm going to put my eggs. So this, this uh, mixture, it has probably about a half a cup of flour in it. And you probably thought like, oh, she just dumped flour in there and she didn't measure. How is she going to know how much? Because a recipe usually says, you know, five cups of flour. And it gives you an exact measurement. And um, that is my first tip. So I call this the saturation test. You only need as much flour as it will take for this to become a ball of dough. And believe it or not, depending on your elevation, depending on the humidity, like I came from California, the desert, and now I live in the south where it's very, very humid. Completely two different um, environments in the atmosphere. And that was one of the things I was just pulling my hair out because everything I did in California wasn't working here. It all plays a part in the amount of flour that you use. And so you really can't have a measurement on flour. You need to just do a saturation test. And what I mean by that is we're just going to add our flour a little bit at a time until it gets to a certain point. And once it reaches that certain point, we're going to stop. There have been times that I have made bread and I have used three cups of flour and sometimes I've used five completely vastly different amounts and that's why I was always so frustrated because I kept I kept changing recipes like well this isn't a good recipe and so I would get rid of it and I would get a new recipe and um, then it would work and it would work because maybe the atmosphere everything in it was just right for the amount that it was calling for in the recipe and it turned out great but then on an extremely humid day i would go to make it again and it wouldn't so that is the first tip is the saturation test now i'm just adding a half a cup at a time and um in the beginning you could probably um you know it's it's very liquidy and it's not going to um, be ready for a little bit. So um, you can add maybe a cup in the beginning, but once it starts getting more thick, you need to start slowing down. Don't worry about all the lumps that you see in here, all the flour lumps. Those will definitely be all worked out as you need it. And um, so we're just gonna keep adding right at this point because this is still it's even like a thin pancake batter so that's very you know very far from being a bread dough so I'm just going to confidently add a half a cup of flour in it and it will just slowly become thicker and thicker and once it does that I'm going to cut down on the amount of flour I'll use maybe a fourth a cup and I'll just keep adding little bits of it until it passes the saturation test and it becomes a nice ball of dough. Now I'm going to turn the camera into the bowl so you can watch it begin to take shape um, and you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. See it's still just like a very thick pancake batter. So we can confidently add big portions of flour into this and know that it's going to be okay. I'm probably going to go ahead and put a whole cup at this point. But that will probably be the only time that I add that amount. I'll probably drop back down to a half a cup. It's definitely getting thicker. But still more like a batter. Now, if you are an experienced bread maker and you have worked with whole grains and you're struggling with 
having your bread be too dry and crumbly. It is probably because you are adding too much flour. And you think like, oh, I only added flour until, you know, I could start kneading it. Well, the thing with whole grains is it takes time for that flour to actually soak up the liquid. And so sometimes what I will do is I will, I will put in my flour until it reaches about this consistency. And then I'll lay a towel over the top and I'll just let it sit for about 10 minutes. And that gives the the flour time to soak up all that liquid and then when you come back you can leave it like looking like this for 10 minutes and when it comes back it actually is going to look different than it looks now because it has had time to soak up that flour and then it could actually be a stiffer dough than how you left it. It's soaking up the water and then it is more of a true state of what that dough looks like where in the beginning it, it might fool you. It might look like it's ready, but it actually isn't. So maybe go away from it for about 10 minutes and then come back and feel the dough and go from there and you might have a little bit more success. See, as you can see, this is getting really, really stiff. In a second, I'm going to have to change from doing it with this spoon to actually getting my hands in there, even though it's still going to make kind of a mess. It's being really, really hard to do this with a spoon. All right, we're going to add a little bit more, and I'll see if I can still do it with a spoon, but I have a feeling I'm going to have to give in and do it with my hands. Yeah, this is impossible. So this is where working with a Bosch or KitchenAid, it's so nice. You can just, it's very clean. You're not putting your hands into it when it's all goopy like this. But it's definitely coming together. Now the goal is, is to be able to get this into a ball. It might be a bit tacky, but it is going to clean the sides of the bowl. As you're kneading it, the bowl will come clean. And um, see, I'm not putting very much at the end. So what I was explaining about letting it set for 10 minutes, that's more for if you're, if you are someone who's been using whole grains and struggling. That was just a tip for you guys. But if you're using white flour we don't really need to let it sit see this is really coming together and it's cleaning up the bowl you can kind of scrape the bowl with your fingers and work it right into the dough and we're not even we're just gonna let the dough rise right in this bowl just to keep it very clean Wow, look at that. See, it's it's still tacky. You can tell it's still... Probably if I take some of this dough off. I'll use my clean hand. See, it's it's tacky. You can see that on my hands. But it's, you know, I could, I could knead this on the counter by adding little bits of flour. But this dough is looking really, really good. So, uh, yes, I did go and clean my hands. It is not necessary to stop and clean your hands. I just had to because I had to move my camera. Um, so, once you start using your hands, you can just knead it right in the bowl until it becomes a ball of dough that you can take out. And it is tacky, yes. And we're going to still add a little bit more flour, but you can work with this on your counter. So I'm just going to clean the bowl up a little more so that when I put it back in the bowl, you know, all this extra stuff is not in there. So I am going to take some flour and I'm going to put it on the counter and just lay the dough right in there. And we're going to begin to knead it. Now I'll kind of roll it into all the flour. Kind of get it off my hands by rubbing my hands together. 
so that I don't feel like I'm too goopy. And then I kind of roll it in the flour so the whole thing is coated in flour. Now I'm just going to begin to knead it. And everybody has their own style of how they like to knead bread. There is no way. But I will kind of just grab it. And so you're just working in the flour and you're developing the gluten because that right now the gluten in the flour if you just cook this just like this it wouldn't even with the yeast and all that it wouldn't be a light airy loaf of bread it would just be really dense because the gluten was not developed so we need to do that by kneading it now if you're doing it in a machine you would have your dough hook on and you would just knead it and um, if it gets sticky and you can feel like it's sticking back to the bowl just it's because it has that flour has become saturated with the moisture and it you know it needs a little more flour but like right now I'm being able to knead this and it's a little bit tacky but I can totally knead it so I'm not going to add more flour unless it starts getting really sticky and once again we're just going to do it just a couple tablespoons at a time like this is feeling like it's really sticking to me so we're going to add just a little bit so as you can see it's it's just really reading the dough and what it feels like it's not a recipe and i added quite a bit of flour to this recipe but there have been times that i've added a whole lot less than this so it really really depends on what time of the year you're making it you know if you're up in the mountains or in the desert or whatever it is it really does make a difference so this leads us so the first tip was the saturation test and that's what we've been going over this whole time um, the second tip it's called the window pane test and that is a test that you do that will tell you when you are done kneading the bread and a lot of recipes this is the second part that really got me confused and frustrated is a recipe generally says you know knead your dough for six to eight minutes or eight to ten minutes or you know, every recipe is different. It's like, how do you know? Six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes? What is it? And um, you really cannot put a time on kneading because there have been times that I have made bread using the window pane test and I've only kneaded it for like four minutes. And then there have been other times that I used the very same recipe and I need it for 12 to 13 minutes, 15 minutes. And once again, it all depends, just like the saturation test, it all depends on your environment. And so the way that we decide if we are done kneading is the window pane test. And I'll show you exactly what that is. All right, so while I'm kneading this dough, because I don't know how long it's going to take, I'm going to explain the saturate, not the saturation test, the window pane test. Um, step number two so when your dough is strong enough to be able to hold together and not tear you'll know that you are done kneading it and what that looks like is right now my dough is beautiful it's just not sticking to me and it's soft and um, I've been kneading it for a couple minutes so I'm going to run a test on it. I'm going to grab probably like a walnut size piece of dough and I'm going to roll it in a circle, a ball, and then I'm going to slowly pull, pull it, and I'll, I'll do this close, but I'm going to pull it and I'm going to see if I can pull this like I'm going to carefully, um, kind of like as if I was making into a tortilla, and then I'm going to see if I can hold it up to the light, and if I can see the light through it like a window pane, 
and it hasn't torn, then it's ready. But this dough, which I will do a close-up so you guys can see it, but I'm just explaining it to you. This dough, when I got it thin enough and then I tried to pull it thin enough to be able to see light through it, it just started tearing. So that is definitely letting me know it is not ready. If I can get that worked out and then I can hold it up to the light and just pull it very gently and I can see light through it and it does not tear, it stays as a piece of dough without any tears, then it's ready and the gluten is strong enough to hold up. So um, the difficult part of filming this is being able to get the camera behind me so you can see it. And um, today was a very bright day and I thought, oh, this is going to be perfect for shooting this video. And then the clouds disappeared behind, or the sun disappeared behind the clouds and it's, I'm kind of struggling with the lighting. Um, so we're living in a travel trailer before we build our house here out on our piece of property. And um, so I've, right now I'm filming all of my tutorials in a travel trailer and so I'm very susceptible to the lighting. So I really hope that I can get, um, get some good lighting for you guys to be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. But just know I'm, I'm kind of working against the natural lighting of the day. So usually you could take this ball of dough and you could you know, put it up like to your window and you could, you know, look with the sunshine outside and you'd be able to see it really good. But I don't know if that's going to happen for me. Okay, so I have put this right up against the light on my ceiling. So I'm hoping that this will show. So I'm going to roll this in a ball and then I'm going to slowly flatten it. And I'm going to put it right up against the light. And I'm going to try to pull it. And do you see that? It just started tearing. And so we know that that gluten is not developed. It's, it's almost there, but like, see these little tears down here? It is not strong enough to be able to um, hold up your bread. So we're going to continue kneading. So we're just going to knead it. Obviously, it didn't pass that test. So we know that it needs more time. All right, so I have finished kneading it and I've already tested this and it is ready. So I'm gonna show you guys what that looks like. So this camera is, keeps going in and out of focus. So hopefully we can get this to work. So I've got this dough, I'm gonna roll it into a ball and then I'm going to carefully, now obviously if you just pull this, it is gonna break. So you need to carefully kind of coax it and as you can see, you can see light through that and it is not tearing. Even if I go a little bit further out, it is not tearing. So that gluten is really nicely developed. Now obviously if I just went like this, it's going to tear. But if you gently do it, you can see that that is passing the window pane test. Okay, so we've made it through the main part of making the bread. We are on the home stretch as far as skill. So we learned that the saturation test, you don't want to put too much flour in because if you put too much flour in, it's just going to be dry and crumbly. And you learned how to determine if you had enough flour. And then um, the window pane test, you knew exactly when to stop kneading it because you don't want to over, over knead it or under knead it. You want it to just be perfectly, um, the gluten to be perfectly developed. So there is no need to get a fresh bowl out. That's why we cleaned it out in the beginning when we were kneading this. Just put a little bit of oil and put it all over the bowl. And then just gather this up. It's starting to stick to the counter, but it'll just come right up. So I'm going to put this into a nice ball. And I'm going to turn it this way. I'm going to grease the bottom, which this is now going to be the top. Flip it over and just fold it over really nice in there. And now we're going to lay a towel over the top. And then we're going to set it aside and let it begin to rise. Now, that brings us to the third tip. The third tip is how long do we let it rise? And 
you don't want to let it over rise because if it rises for too long it's just going to become weak again and it's going to start falling um, but if you don't let it rise enough it's not going to be that fluffy airy piece of bread and so the way that we tell is after you'll notice that in recipes it will say when doubled in size you know you're done and that's really hard to know because most bowls are littler at the bottom and they get wider at the top. So, I mean, the bottom of my bowl is only about this big compared to how big this is. So what's double in size? It's not, you know, halfway up the bowl. Um, so it's really hard to know. So I totally disregard that. <clears throat> and the third tip is do a poke test. And so when you think that this looks like it has doubled in size, um, you can test it to find out if it's ready to go in the oven. You're going to take two of your fingers and you're going to poke it and it will make two holes. Now if those holes instantly start filling up and they're gone very quickly, um, you know it still needs to rise more. But if you stick your fingers in it and those holes stay, they're, they're going to fill in just a little bit, but if they stay pretty much indented, then that means the dough is ready and we need to get them into the loaf pans. So um, then once they're in the loaf pans, we're gonna have them rise again and we'll do that poke test again in the loaf pan to see if they've risen to be double um, as well. So this poke test is gonna be used twice, once while it's in the bowl and once while it's in the loaf pan. So um, now this could take, it depends on the day. If it's a cold, rainy day, it, it could take a lot longer than if it's a hot summer day. I mean, I've had bread rising in like 30 minutes versus like an hour and a half, just depending on the atmosphere because a lot of recipes will say let rise for you know 60 minutes and that's not that's not accurate because it really depends on the day and if some of you are fortunate enough that in your oven there's a button uh, option a proofing option and it's p-r-o-o-f proof because you're proofing your dough and that's what it calls when you're letting it rise and there's actually an adjustment in your oven that you can just hit that button and it makes it the perfect temperature. Like if I could pick the perfect temperature for dough to rise, your oven is set for that. So if you have that, use it. Put the, a towel over it, stick it in the oven, hit that proofing button and um, let it rise. But um, of course you'll still need to do the poke test, but it will rise quicker than if you, it was like a cold day. Um, as well as if you have a dehydrator, you can set it down to like 87, 88, 89, 90 degrees, and it will be a perfect rising temperature as well. So, um, but I generally just put towel over it, set it aside, and I use this time to clean up the kitchen and get my loaf pans and grease them and get them all ready to go so that when this is ready, I'm ready to go. I can tell the dough is just about ready to be tested, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to butter my loaf pans. Now the loaf pans that I have purchased, these have perfectly straight sides. I had bought some loaf pans a while back without um, really thinking about it. I just went and I'm like, a loaf pan is a loaf pan, but it wasn't. The sides, they went in. And so when your loaf of bread, when it was done cooking, the top, it didn't go straight down. It kind of went in and I didn't, I didn't like how that, it didn't make like a nice heel of bread. And so I went online and I found loaf pans that the sides were perfectly straight down. So um, I will try to find those again on Amazon and I will link them in my blog. And then um, the second thing I want to mention is I've tried a lot of things to better my loaf pans with. I've done coconut oil. I've done all different kinds of things. Um, and I have found that the very best thing to use is butter. When I use butter, the, the bread, it just falls right out. Um, I used to struggle with the, the dough sticking to the loaf pan and I would have to get a better knife and try and get it and then sometimes the bottom would stick and my perfect loaf of bread would all of a sudden be ruined because I couldn't get it out of the pan. But butter really makes a difference. So that's all I will use now. So we're going to test this. We're going to do the poke test. That's the final 
um, tip and we're gonna um, see if it's ready to go. All right, look how beautiful that is. That is just beautiful dough. It is so light and airy. So we're gonna do the poke test. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, let me come around here. I'm gonna do it right here and I'm just gonna poke two fingers in. And you see the, the holes. Now we're just gonna watch it. It is gonna close a little bit, but if this dough was not ready, these would almost completely fill in within a couple minutes. They would, you wouldn't even look like you had poked a hole there. So as you can see, they, they kind of bounce back just a little bit, but those holes are stained. That, mean that, this, that means that this dough is ready um, for the next step. So you're gonna wanna just punch it down and deflate it and um, now you're going to want to take it, I take it out of the bowl and I reform it back into a ball and I let it just sit on the counter for about five minutes because you've kind of punched it down and kind of, I guess the best description is you kind of scared it, you kind of scared the gluten and um, punched it all down and now you just got to let it rest and kind of get its bearings again and then we will um, divide it in half and go ahead and um, place it into the loaf pans. This dough is already rising again. This is really, really good dough. I wish you guys could feel it. It is super soft and pliable. It's just a really good dough. And I know you'll have success with this because just working with all-purpose flour, it's pretty much you'll have a success. So I take this and I divide it in half and I'm not too, I mean, you don't have to be exact. I mean, if you want to be, you can get a scale and weigh it. I just kind of eyeball it. I'll just um, lay it on top. It looks about half. So actually, when I um, said that there was three tips, I should have actually said there was four because there is one more trick that I do. Now, if you've ever made bread before and you've baked it and it looks beautiful and you get it out of the oven and you slice into it and you find that hole, there's like a big hole in the middle and it's just so frustrating because um, you just want that perfect piece of bread and then there's a hole, whether it be like little somewhere in there or sometimes I've gotten pretty big holes. And so, um, there's a trick to be able to make sure that doesn't happen. So I'm going to take this and just form it in. I'm, I can kind of see some bubbles, so I'm going to kind of deflate it, just press on it. And I'm actually going to stop right here and I'm going to bring the camera in so you can watch my hands. All right, so I'm going to kind of press a lot of those, whole, those bubbles that are forming. You'll kind of see these little air bubbles. So just kind of knead it just a little bit and you can kind of hear them popping and then I just form it into a loaf like this and that trick that I was just telling you about to make sure is you want to take your bread and you want to throw it down on the counter like five times really hard that's three four Five. Whoops, didn't quite get that in the camera. And then just form it into a loaf. Once you're done slapping it down on the camera, uh, on the counter. And then we're just going to lay it right into the pan. Now, you want to make sure that your dough touches the sides. Because dough, it rises up. It's not going to rise that way. So you want to make sure that it's long enough, it's touching the sides. I would much rather make sure it's pressed down and filling it in than to be tall and lacking on the sides. So this dough is done. So you're basically going to knead it a little bit, get the air bubbles out, and then slam it down on the counter about five times and that's going to get rid of that, those holes that you get in the middle. Pressing all those air holes that I can see. They're really thin bubbles on the top and then I'll start forming it into a loaf which isn't it's just more like spreading and tucking you want the top to be smooth you don't want to like pull it and tear it so just real carefully and you're just gonna and then I'll 
reform it a little bit just so it's not long. It is time to check the bread. Look at that. It is well over the top. So we need to get these in. We don't want them to rise too much. So I'm going to poke. Let's see if you can see that. I'm going to poke, you know, do the poke test on it. So I'm just going to go down here and I'm going to poke in. And um, let's see. That indention, it is stain. It bounced back just a little bit, but it is stain. So this is ready to go. I preheated the oven and I'm gonna go pop them in. Wow, would you look at that. These are gorgeous. And normally I take these out before they get this browned, um, but it is a little harder. We've got a makeshift kind of a, we've got a propane tank hooked up to a stove because um, we are in a trailer. And um, I have a little bit harder of a time keeping things cooking just perfectly right. So um, normally these are a little bit lighter in color, but these are still really pretty. Um, so I talked about how you would know, I, I had mentioned about turning them halfway or after 15 minutes and then covering them up to keep them from browning too much. And then how you know if the bread is done cooking. That was a really big struggle for me. I would look beautiful and then I would take it out and I would thump the bottom. People always say, you know, thump the bottom and if it sounds hollow, then you know it's done. And I had so many times I would cut into the loaf of bread and the very center would still be raw dough. And that was always so disappointing. It was like the whole thing was done and then it was still a little bit raw. And so then um, I discovered there's a couple things you can do. First of all, when you smell the bread cooking in the oven, and in the beginning it smells really sweet and it, it just smells so delicious. It's a very sweet smelling bread. It is not ready for sure. It will then go from smelling very sweet to smelling more toasty and um, almost like, oh, it doesn't smell quite as good as it did before. It, um, it just is a more of a browned, um, a toasty fla smelling um, flavor. And so um, that's more like what you're looking for. But if you want an exact, I mean, you can kind of train your nose to be able to smell as it shifts from that sweet to the more, um, um, I don't know what word to use, toasty smell, I guess. Um, but there's an exact way. So once it hits that smell, I can see that shift. So another way that you can figure out if it's done for sure is that you can flip. See how easily that just came right out. And when I had told you to use butter, it just comes right out. So flip it over and get that meat thermometer, which I'll have this linked or one like it linked in my blog post and stick it in the center. Push it down towards probably in the center of the bread, turn it on and 200 is what you're looking for. So if you know, I go out and it's 179 or you know, 182, I kind of leave it in for another couple minutes. And then it, um, once it reaches 200, you know it's done. You don't even have to wonder. Just take them out, and then you need to definitely um, take them out of the pans right away because they it starts sweating inside when it's still warm and it's still you know enclosed in there. And um, I just love how easy that is to get out and it's still enclosed in there, it will just start sweating and get wet and then your bread will actually be wet. Now I know you're gonna be really tempted to cut right into it and start enjoying it. And you can if you don't, if you're not planning on um, storing this for a long period of time. So if you're gonna eat the whole thing for dinner, then go right ahead. I would let it cool for about, you know, just um, maybe five or 10 minutes because if you cut into it right now, the bread will get kind of gummy. Um, but once it gets that initial cool down, then go right ahead and slice it and enjoy it. But if you made this to um, maybe slice up and use for sandwiches and you want it to last you know, over several days, if you cut it at all while it's still warm, you're gonna, a lot of the moisture 
that you want in that bread to keep your bread moist for a long period of time, it's going to escape and it's going to evaporate. Because once you, if I was to cut this, you would just see steam coming out. And so um, you want to keep all that moisture in because this is all cooked. It's hard, you know, on the outside, and so it's, it's going to keep all that moisture inside. But once you cut it, it's going to break that seal, and then you're going to lose all your moisture out to the air. So let this sit here. Even though you just want to cut a little piece off and eat it, let it sit here and cool down 100%. Like, not even kind of warm, 100%. It's cold. And um, then once it's cold, if you want, you can just put the whole loaf in a bag and put it in your freezer. What I like to do is I like to slice it up and put it in um, a bag if I'm going to store it in the freezer so I can just break off pieces very easily. Um, so however you want to do that, go right ahead. But if you're, if you're going to just serve it with dinner, yes, for sure. Put it on a cutting board with a knife and stick it on the table and enjoy it while it's warm. But if you're trying to store it for, you know, and you want it to be moist, then just try and refrain from cutting into it. Now I'm going to grab my butter. What I like to do, I've got a pastry knife in my butter. Um, it's softened better. I just like to brush the whole top with butter and just give it a really beautiful glaze. And then um, just let it sit and cool. So that is really how simple. It's a lot of details I gave you, but it really is the, um, the key to having successful bread. And you don't have to worry about, you know, things not turning out. You can follow all those guidelines I gave you and you will have perfect bread every time. Now, one thing, this is just one little um, serving suggestion. Um, whenever we have Thanksgiving and we would have it at our house a lot of times and you know you're going to have all that leftover turkey meat and I would have um, company, you know, at my house for the Thanksgiving weekend. We would always want to use up the turkey meat afterwards and so a day or two before Thanksgiving I would make a couple batches of this bread and I would pre-slice it put it in bags um, even if I did it like the day before so that it would still be nice and um, I would do it like on Wednesday and then it would be in bags and then on Friday so Thursday you would have your Thanksgiving meal on Friday we would make turkey sandwiches with the leftover turkey and I'd put a bunch of crisp lettuce and mustard and um, some tomatoes and even um, if you want to just do turkey and the cranberries it's a great way to use up your Thanksgiving leftovers um, they make the most this bread makes the most delicious turkey sandwiches so I just wanted to throw that in there when, that, when Thanksgiving comes and you're having a house full of company remember this and make yourselves a couple loaves of this and just pull it all out the next day and it will be a completely fresh new meal you're not just going to be feeling like you're eating leftovers so anyway i'm going to let this cool all the way and then we're going to enjoy a loaf and i'll store the other one well i hope that you found that helpful i hope that if you've made bread and you've had a hard time and run into a lot of the problems that we talked about that you found a lot of answers here in this tutorial and if you haven't really tried bread, I'd encourage you to maybe dive in to try to make a loaf for yourself. It really is totally doable once you have the tips and tricks. And so once we went over the saturation test and the window pane test and the poke test and, you know, throwing your bread on the counter, all of those things are going to play into creating successful loaves of bread time after time after time. And, you know, when we start baking for ourselves and start being able to supply um, our kitchen with things that we've made ourselves instead of buying everything from the store, it's such a good feeling of resilience and um, just to be able to produce some of our own food. And so I really encourage you to dive in and try your hand at making a loaf of bread. Start with the all-purpose flour. And then once you have that mastered, you know, you can step into learning how to work with whole grains and 
sprouted grains. And so um, if you want the recipe, don't forget to click the link below for the full printable recipe of this bread. And if you enjoyed this, why don't you go ahead and subscribe and click that little bell so that you will be notified every time I post. I bring stuff to my channel weekly, a lot of delicious content. So you're not going to want to miss any of my recipes. So go ahead and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Look at that. Thank <laughs> you.